wonder what it would be like to be born in a manger. Yeah. Wonder what ever happened to baby Jesus. He, he grew up. What? Wait. So you're saying that the baby Jesus Christmas story is the same as the adult walk on water Jesus? Yeah. Thanks, honey. Wow, I just never really put the two concepts together. <laughs> Wonder what happened to that guy, huh? <laughs> he... he went to the cross. That's the same guy? Yeah. So what you're saying is baby Jesus is the same as cross Jesus? Yeah. I mean, there's some time in there, right? I mean, he... he grew up, he taught people, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and came back to life, and, you know, now he lives in our hearts. That's the same guy? The Jesus that lives in our hearts? <sighs> okay, I was really, oh, wow. Okay, I never really put all those guys together, you know? Only one guy. I tell you this. Here's an idea. Maybe we stop just making Christmas all just this once a year isolated thing, but we make it an ongoing story about the salvation in our hearts and lives. Up top. It's the idea. Uh, if all of you saw that on Sunday, I'm sorry you had to watch it again, although I think it's still funny. Um, but uh, it's just a reminder about what the season is about. And then also uh, just want to remind you and encourage you uh, to invite people uh, to our Christmas Eve services. Well, and every service really ever that we have here. Uh, but our Christmas Eve service is at 1, 3, and 5. Um, welcome to our Wednesday worship service. I love how Lutheran we are. We're all scattered, you know, just in case we sit by somebody and have to talk to them, except for Kristen. Yep, yep. Thank you, Kristen, for setting the bar higher. No, but I am so happy you're here. Thank you. We have some delicious soup afterwards in the same format each Wednesday. Uh, we will, we're going to hear in just a second, a few seconds, from a different voice than we... Uh, we always read out of the book of Isaiah. Last week we heard from Mary's mother. Uh, obviously scripture doesn't recount any telling of Mary's mother's thoughts about her daughter being pregnant with the Messiah. Um, but I liked uh, that perspective. And this week we get to hear from Isaiah. Isaiah whose readings foretell the coming of the Prince of Peace. And so we get to uh, hear this is a, a drama, uh, a little perspective from Isaiah when God told him to prepare the way. So Beth, if you don't mind. Hi. So, this is what you want me to tell them, the people, your people who have lived in dark exile all these many years with their, their backs up against some Babylonian wall. It was one thing when you had me tell the king that a, a virgin would give birth. Go back to sleep, my dear. I'm talking to God. Is he listening? Uh, what do you mean, is he listening? Well, are you listening to him? You see what I mean, Lord? Even my own wife questions me. Now, you are God Almighty. You do what you want to do. But you want me to tell the people that Messiah is going to be just uh, some plain fellow like one of us? Uh, that he's going to suffer? He's going to die? Uh, why not Moses uh, to lead us out of exile? Or, uh, or King David, uh, the mighty warrior, not some tiny li little... 
Ah. Uh, where is the oil for the lamp? It's where it always is. Uh, ah. This is what I'm talking about, Lord. We are a people in darkness, stumbling around, stubbing our toe on the sin of the world. We need a mighty rescuer. We need, uh, we need a savior. Not some tiny little... Ah. Such a tiny flame. And the whole room is filled with light. Huh. I am a man of unclean lips. Forgive me, Lord. I will tell them what you have shown me, even if I don't understand it. I will trust you, good Lord, in your own good time to, to bring us uh, Emmanuel, to bring us light and hope. Uh, Light and hope. I'm coming back to bed. I don't know about you, but I've read those Isaiah texts. I heard them read for as long as I can remember, leading up to Christmas and on Christmas. And it's, it's a great perspective to think that Isaiah preached to a people in exile that their liberation would come through a baby or through a human who would die. That was the good news Isaiah gave to the people. So I have to imagine Isaiah had moments where he questioned what God was thinking or planning like all of us do. So next week we'll hear another perspective uh, that maybe we don't hear uh, every year around this time. And so I appreciate you trusting me with that. We're going to move into our lighting of the Advent candle. Um, and uh, each week uh, on Sundays we've had families light them. I'm at my family's going to light them this Sunday while I'm gone. Because I told them if I'm not here, they've got to step up, you know. Um, and so, uh, and, and Pastor Monty will be here with us this weekend, or Monty... Um, Montgomery Peterson is her name, will be with us this weekend, and uh, I will miss you all as I'll be in Minnesota marrying uh, a former youth of mine from many, many years ago. So uh, with that said, Beth, you can go. There's a short video. We use that as a time of prayer as I light the two candles, our hope and peace candles for this Advent season. Wednesday movie time. Um, 
each week. I invite you to stand as you are able today and sing Prepare the Royal Highway. If you want to turn in your hymnal to 264, you can. Otherwise, the lyrics will be up on the screen. may be seated. This past Sunday, we heard from a piece of scripture that we hadn't been in before, I think. At least I have never preached from uh, Habakkuk. Uh, But we talked about peace and how to find peace. We'll continue with our word study uh, on these Wednesdays uh, as we enter into the word peace. One that we're very familiar with in scripture, shalom. But shalom in Hebrew it has so many different meanings when it's used throughout the scriptures and within the Hebrew community. So I will let people much smarter than me teach us about the word peace in scripture. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. 
In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom. And his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others. Like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven and on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. As always, I don't really need to add anything to that. You've got it figured out? Yes? And every area of your life will be peaceful from the moment you leave here today, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, I, I love uh, how they talk about completeness and wholeness. You know, when we look around at the world, we use words oftentimes like broken or chaotic within our own country, but also around the world. And, and we desire peace. God has desired peace for God's people forever. Way back in history, as recorded in the Old Testament, when God gave the law to Moses and set up the roles and the duties of the priests to guide the Jews in their spiritual journeys, he gave them this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you the Hebrew word that they talked about is shalom, one that I think many of us have heard before. Yeah, amen? And he talks about the different ways that they would use shalom. So in Joshua, they talked about the actual building of a wall. And the wall was finished once it reached shalom. Completeness, wholeness. God desires completeness and wholeness for all of God's people. And this is the peace that came to us in a baby. God with us, Emmanuel. The peace that Isaiah prophesied that Isaiah promised God would provide for God's people. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and peace and righteousness from that time on and forever. The Jews of Jesus' day wanted a Messiah who, who would come in and overthrow all powers, political powers, military powers, all powers. And they thought, based off their histories, that that would happen in some dramatic fashion where people would literally be swept away in a sea or where mighty armies would knock down walls. And yet God surprises all of us by giving us, promising us shalom in the form of a baby, a human baby. Yes, there will be the absence of war and hatred, but it will come at a different cost. 
Near the end of Jesus' life, he spoke these words to his disciples. This is right before he was arrested and crucified. This is that wonderful Gospel of John uh, section from chapter 13 into about 16 and 17, which records Jesus' last moments and that last supper. It's a very intimate conversation that he has with them over and over again. And he tells them a number of things. Some very famous lines from the Gospel of John are found in that section. In fact, side note, I've decided that uh, after Christmas until Lent and through Lent, we're going to go back and begin in the first chapter of the Gospel of John and walk through it through Lent. Who's excited? Good. I am. Uh, Christian is good. But in, in the Gospel of John chapter 14, Jesus says these words, Arene, peace I leave with you. My peace, my arene, I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, for the world does not understand this peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus wasn't just encouraging the disciples for the future church, but he knew that within hours he would be arrested and then eventually beaten, judged, and crucified. So the ultimate trial of their life would really happen over the next few days. And yet he told them not to be afraid, not to be troubled, to, be, to seek peace. And his, his encouragement, or in fact we could call it his command, was not just to seek peace with one another because it was easy. At that same table were the people that would betray him and deny him. And so he says, seek peace with all of them. All of you must seek some sort of wholeness and completeness. Paul says in Ephesians, for Jesus himself is our peace. As we experience God's presence in the community, in our own lives, and I hope, and I hope, 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 that your prayer life at times reflects Isaiah that we saw to start worship here. Those are really honest conversations that we should all have with God. Not just simple platitudes or prayers that we've memorized, but honest, calling out, crying out, and even questioning to understand better what God has called us to be in this world. Paul goes on to say, after for he himself is our peace, he goes on to say, he who has made the two groups one, he's made the two people one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his own flesh the law with its commands and regulations. So he's, he's put to death the old way we thought we could approach God and says forever because of me, forever, all have access to God. And the, the requirement is simply to know that you are loved by God and to love others the same way. Paul goes on to say his purpose, Christ's purpose, was to create in himself one new humanity for the whole, thus making Irene peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them and all people to God through the cross. Because on that cross, he put to death their hostility. God with us brings peace between us and God, but he also brings peace amongst people because we are all drawn together and unified in God through Jesus. This is the perfect picture of shalom, wholeness and safety and the restoration of people, but it's also really hard work. If we don't experience peace in our own lives, it'll be very difficult for us to, desire, to, to work towards creating peace between those who are difficult to be around. But God says the only way for us to fully experience the reconciliation offered from the cross is to seek wholeness and community. Have you ever had a moment where you so desperately desired peace between a people or a person and then it was achieved and your perspective changed or perhaps you thought never, never will me and that person experience peace and then it happened or have you ever been in a moment where you're so overwhelmed or anxious or afraid that peace seems impossible, that people telling you don't worry, it'll be okay seems like a lie and offensive language? Yesterday, I led the funeral service for um, Norman Malashik. Isn't that a great name? Norman Malashik. Now, I never called him Norman. In fact, until the service yesterday, I'd never called him Norman. Um, I called him Coach. And I know every time I tell you guys and gals that I play football, you're surprised. But again, I actually played on the team. I was on the team. I got pictures. Um, but Norman, Norman was this great coach. And uh, my, my sophomore year, this is when I met him, um, my sophomore year, I got there, and Bill Vassos, good giant Bill Vassos was our head coach, and was an incredible guy. Bill, love you, Bill, if you're, but um, he also was loud, and uh, I, was, I was insecure and nervous. I had come from junior high football, and I was a very average player, 
and I screwed up big time on a, a very simple play, and I ran off on the sideline, and I met Coach Norm Malashik for the first time. He came up to me, and he put his arm around me and said, hey, don't worry about it, son. Get back in there. Do it better next time. Now, that was simple, and it was little, and he was just a coach, but it really shaped my perspective. And then I noticed over the course of three years in football that Norm did this with everybody. He was a constant encourager. Now, he didn't excuse mistakes. He wanted you to go back out there and learn and be better, but he was the ultimate encourager. He just didn't believe in knocking you down with words. He believed in building you up. That was Coach. And, and, and I, I, I stayed connected to Coach all these years. I went back and coached a little bit with him, and, and then our family stayed close. I was a part of all three of his kids' weddings uh, in, in different ways. I married the last two. I baptized his grandson, Tan, Turner. Um, we just stayed connected. And then he joined my golf league this past year, which was great because I needed somebody like him to encourage me throughout the course of the golf season. Um, th- three weeks ago, three, two weeks before Thanksgiving, I wasn't going to talk about this today, but now I am. Two weeks before Thanksgiving, uh, Coach started texting me. I mean, we, we communicate, but we don't talk very often outside of golf league and events socially. And he started texting me, and he said, hey, I'd like to talk to you about kind of, you know, my wishes and stuff. And I thought, he's 60 years old. He's, he's in better health than me. And, and, I, and I said, well, well, okay, you know, we'll set up a time. And, and I kind of pushed it off a little bit. I, I thought he was being a little bit goofy. I, I didn't understand. So finally I called him the Saturday after Thanksgiving. And we talked on the phone for about an hour. And if, come to find out that he was going in to have a heart valve replaced, which actually isn't a very major, I mean, any heart surgery is major, but these, these have become more routine. Doctors are very good at these surgeries. And, uh, and he was extremely nervous about it. And, and it shocked me. I've never heard the guy nervous. He's always been this coach. And, and so we talked, and, and he just said, you know, I want to make sure things are ready. And he gave me a letter, and he gave me the order of his service. All these things, and in the back of my head, I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to need this for 20 or 30 years, man. Um, and then at the end, uh, he started talking about his faith. Now, this is the first time in our relationship that we've ever really talked about faith. That might surprise you as I'm a pastor and I'm on a golf league with him, but we talked about his faith. And he talked about Jesus. And it was such a unique experience for me to hear this guy that I looked up to for so long talk about Jesus. And he talked about the peace that he had going into this surgery on Monday. And he had peace. He had this absolute peace. And it it challenges me, because I wonder in that moment if I would have had the same peace. He obviously had something going on. He knew something. Fast forward, and then we'll come back to the last thing we talked about. On Monday, I got a phone call. I actually just, just left John Wolodzewski in the hospital up in Freighter, or Pro Health, and um, I got a phone call from Coach around 4.30, and I thought it was him, and it was his wife, Terry, uh, sobbing uncontrollably. Um, they'd found more damage in the heart, and uh, could I come down there? And so I went down there on Monday evening and sat with the family and prayed. He was on the surgery table for 15 hours, um, and uh, it came out on an ECMO machine, which keeps your heart pumping. And, and eventually, after a four-day four battle, uh, Norm passed away. His family was shocked, uh, just shocked. They went through his phone and saw all the messages between him and I, and they had all sorts of questions for me. I didn't know this was private. Um, and so yesterday, I spent all day, all afternoon with them, and we had a beautiful service. But I, I talked about, in that time and with the family, the amazing peace Norm had on that Saturday, that phone call. It ended in tears and prayer. But he had such a peace going into that. And that can be comfort for people. Now, it doesn't make the family's life any easier. They've lost Norm. But, but I assured him that I, I, I have talked to people in those situations, and they don't always have peace. They're overcome by fear and anxiety, which is very natural. But Norm had this peace. So that's what we cling to, a peace like that, a shalom like that, an arena like that, that in the midst of whatever life holds, we have a God who offers us peace, a God who does not abandon us, a God who in grief weeps with us but stands beside us. So whatever, hold, whatever you are bringing into this room, whatever you are holding in this room that is taking away your peace, I, I invite you to leave it here today. Remember that Jesus comes in power as the Prince of Peace. Oh, that we would have the peace like Norm and the peace like John who moments before I talked to Terry that last Monday, John Wolodzewski just said that he was done fighting. But he, he had peace, and he started to lift off all these goals. He wanted to see his kids get older and have grandkids, and, and he was just so happy. Oh, that I would have that kind of response near the end of my life. 
So friends, let me encourage you that we have a God who comes in power as the Prince of Peace, always with us, restoring us to God through wholeness and comfort. And may he be your peace, not just today, not just this week, and not just this Advent season, but always. And may we be encouragers of our community. May we seek reconciliation, and may we preach and teach shalom and arene in every setting. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we come to you today acknowledging that peace is not often easy. I myself, Lord, and, and, I, and I assume this community gathered, we struggle sometimes with the lists of things that we need to do that don't get done and they rob us of peace. Those arguments or disagreements or, or painful experiences that rob us of peace, God. And so we are asking you, Lord, to bring about shalom in our life, to bring about irene in our life, to help us see, God, that peace Peace is the best way. Remind us, God, that peace was made possible to us by the life and death of your son, Jesus Christ. Let us be a people. Let us be a community that's marked by the way that we hope in you, the way that we share your peace, the way that we exclaim your joy, and by the way that we love like you love us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lift up all those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit today. Lord, we ask that you would offer your presence to them. We ask for healing. We ask for comfort. Use your church to be a source of healing and comfort as well, Lord. We ask that. And God, we lift up to you now those who are on our hearts in need of healing. Lord, in your mercy, in your prayer. And God, we thank you. We thank you for those saints who have gone before us. We thank you for John and Norman and all those others who have lived their lives in a way that encouraged the church, that give us hope. And we also thank you for the promise of resurrection. We thank you for the promise of eternity that we know those that we have lost are with you and are counted as saints amongst that host in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, let us be a people of peace. In this Advent season, as we await the arrival of Jesus, the baby, God, let us do so with expectant and joyful waiting, knowing that you have come, Lord, that you are with us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take a moment to share the peace with each other, friends. Receive this blessing and send it today. Did I turn my microphone off? Okay, thank you. Perhaps you've seen uh, Nicole. She's, uh, she comes with her two little boys. She's been worshiping with us for a while. Um, and she's usually in the back, and she's got two younger boys, and they come up. They gave me this beautiful gift that they had found at, I think, a flea market. Uh, but on it, it says, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And it's just, I don't even know what it is. Um, but it's fantastic, and I'm going to leave it right here. And they gave it to me on Sunday, which was the Sunday we celebrated peace. So what a great gift, but we, th we're, we are so thankful for them. Friends, receive this blessing today. May the God of all hope, may the God of all peace, the God of all joy, and the God of all love equip you to go out into the world and do the work that God has called you to do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let's have some soup. Amen.